Hello everyone, this is Gary Garretts, and this video is focused on looking at the variety of what painting and drawing equipment you may use to go outside and play in air paint or even use inside your studio. Through many years of drawing and painting outdoors and going through a lot of gear, I've learned to field strip my equipment down to get the most out of its limited weight, cost, and hassle. Remember, these are just my experience and observations and opinions. You will certainly adjust to your own needs and wants, and though I do have it at this point down to a pretty good science. We will go through several options on the most of the materials in this video, and I'll explain why I've chosen this equipment. For the most part, it's weight, usability in the field, its ruggedness, or use in travel and mobility, packing, and hiking. So the first piece of gear will be palettes, where you store your paints. These will vary from moist to dry pigments. The kits will vary in size from medium-sized boxes down to small pocket-sized mini sets. The first one up is my workhorse, the Transon Paint Storage and Palette Box. It has 24 separate smaller boxes, six clamps to securely hold down the lid. You can see the six clamps lock down the lid pretty securely and are fairly sturdy. When I take the lid off, you can see that though I haven't used this kit for a few weeks, most of the paint is still moist and right out, like right out, out of the tube. Though not wet enough to drip when held upside down, this is why I like this system because rather than worrying about it running all into the other paints, the rubberized lid forms a good seal to keep each compartment isolated when you just throw it in a pack or a bag, even if you're like a slob like me and don't clean the lid. One important point I will talk about is that the clamps are the weak link in the system and sometimes break. They are relatively cheap to buy, so I ordered two boxes and cannibalized replacement pieces from the second set. But over the last five years, it's only happened a couple of times. You might notice it's also got a nice little thumb ring if you like to paint that way. So just for the heck of it, I decided to uh, show you what it looks like when it comes in the shipping box. Now this is the Transon. Now, there's several knockoffs of this, so several different manufacturers, but this is the original container. And they also make it in a 36, which has slightly smaller boxes to it. And as I pull it out, you may notice that there's instructions, obviously, and then it has a separate pallet on the bottom, which comes out and attaches to the side of the original pallet when you take the lid off. Now we come to the Masterson Stay Wet palette. And I own a few of these with different color palettes depending on the locations I paint at. Warmer palettes for out in the desert, cooler palettes like greens and blues for up in the mountains. I even have a couple of separate ones for portrait painting and figure painting. The idea here is that there's a wet sponge underneath here and it keeps the paper on top of it, the palette paper, damp and moist, which also keeps the uh, paint fairly moist as well. Uh, one of the problems it does have that it builds up mold every now and then and you have to kind of spray in a uh, solution to kind of get rid of that or keep it down. One important point on these you have to remember is you have to keep them fairly flat because if you turn them sideways some of the paint does run. Here's another little travel kit that I use for inside airplanes where I don't have to worry about uh, bringing in uh, wet materials into the plane. I can throw this in my backpack. It fits, kind of fits in my back pocket. What I did do is I customized this kit. I took out the original cakes that are in there and put my own colors in, my own tube colors. So I have warms, cools of each color, a couple of earth colors, a black, a brown, and then where the sponge was is where the white paint is kept down. So this little Windsor Newton kit is even smaller. Used for museums, it fits in a front shirt pocket. Difference is, is this is watercolor, and I have my colors arranged for the warms on the top, the cools on the bottom, and then again the white gouache that's for covering on the inside of where the brush is normally held. So this next little kit is nice and versatile and small, and you may notice it doesn't have any colors in it right now. The reason for that is, is that I owned one and was painting in the Grand Canyon and dropped it off a cliff and... <laughs> Uh, couldn't find it, so this is the replacement. This next set is also very nice and small. And one thing, the reason I show you this is you can see what happens when you don't pay attention to those wet gouache colors and they'll flow into one another. That's not a good thing. 
Now we get to the metal enamel butcher trays, which I do most of my paint mixing in. They come in various sizes, but I find the 7 by 10 and the 8 by 12 inch trays to be the easiest to use in the field and travel with. They're very sturdy. They take a lot of beating. You can see the enamel's been chipped off a little bit, but they hold up really well and have really nice edges to them. So right now what I'm going to do is a little demo to show you how I use the system. It's not so much about color mixing or paint theory. It's just how I put all of this stuff together I've showed you so far. And you can see that that palette fits really nicely inside that uh, 7x10 tray. And then when I paint, the paints really don't mix together and get messy. I use the tray there to kind of pick and choose your paint. Do your mixing. It's left a little bit in that white, but not a lot. And then you can bring the other colors into it from the outside. So you can see I can use the original color and do some mixing and then paint, well not objectively of course, right on this piece of watercolor paper. As you can see I'm pooling these colors so I'm keeping little reservoirs of the original color in there as I mix my new colors off of it and then mix them also on the paper as I go along depending on the wet or dryness of the media. I'm going to pull in here for a little bit more of a close-up so you can see the actual paint mixing and how I use these pools to kind of connect all the colors together. And you have a much wider field of painting than you do if you were using little cups or little dishes. The reason I like this system is that when you go into those pools of color in those individual boxes, you keep the polluting part, the idea of mixing the colors in the boxes down to a minimum. Therefore, the colors stay more pure and when you do your mixing on the palette and then eventually on the painting, the colors have much more of a vibrancy uh, rather than graying down, unless you need to gray them down, which you do on the palette. Another nice little feature on this is if you use the one side of the palette to paint on, you leave paint there, and you have to do another quick painting, you can just flip the metal tray around and put the paint where the other paint is, and then you have a fairly clean surface on the palette to start again. Now another couple of inconveniences that happen when you use this system is, is those, that box, you seal it up, uh, sometimes some of the colors grow mold on them. So what I do is I have this little teeny tiny spray bottle that I mix a little bit of rubbing alcohol in, about one quarter, and then spray it on top. That cuts down the mold and moistens the paint up quite a bit. Now comes the colors, and this is probably the most difficult part because it's also not only the most expensive part of your painting uh, kit, uh, but it's also a little bit on the subjective side. I've done a lot of research about what artists, other artists use and a lot of experimentation on my own to see what works out in the field. But as you can see, the red X's mean the stuff that I think is pretty much primary, pretty much what you should have in your kit uh, to give the effects that you want. Mostly primaries with a little bit of kind of secondary colors. As you may notice, this is the way that my transcend palettes laid out. I've got the warms on one side and then works in, into the more tree colored greens and then the blue skies and then into the earth colors with black and white on the opposite ends. So this is the box of paint that I store uh, my tubes of gouache in when I'm taking a trip. I usually car camping for a few weeks, maybe three weeks or so, so I'll need some refills. If it's just a couple two three days maybe I'm taking a trip uh, overseas and it's going to be a week or so I don't take this because the uh, transit box holds a lot of paint and I have the secondary smaller painting boxes as well to kind of cover that you might notice that in the kit I added uh, extra pencils uh, palette knife a eyedropper to drop water on the inside and even a small chopstick to mix the paint up sometimes if I need to by the way, it's just a cheap fishing tackle box that I bought at a sporting goods store for about five bucks. So, okay, at this point, here's a zipperable brush case, very flexible, holds a lot of brushes. You notice there's a pencil and eraser on the in center. It's got these Velcro flaps so you can put your brushes up like this. 
And it's even got a little strap if you happen to want to hang it in a tree or hang it off of something and hold your paintbrushes like that. Like I said, very versatile. It's also very rugged. And so this is also a little bit on the subjective side in that fact that I'm going to show you uh, the brushes that I happen to like. You will eventually, of course, find your own selection that works for you. So the first brush that got by us was called a rigger brush. I use that for uh, branches and smaller trees. Here's a flat, that smaller one that I'll use for a brush. Uh, I like this chisel brush sometimes for buildings. It gives you a nice edge. Uh, flat brush coming up that I use for a lot of stuff. So that's my usual blocking in for stone, um, mountains. And then the next one coming up is called a mop brush. And that's a really, really super, super soft brush. It eats up a lot of water and I use it for skies, sometimes big fields and forests. So on the left are just bigger brushes of the ones that I've just mentioned. I have a tendency to use these brushes a lot for blocking stuff in. I mean, really big portions of the paintings. Um, even up to like a one inch, inch and a half brushes sometimes for skies uh, that I have in a separate little kit. This is another flat. Uh, what you have coming up is a dagger brush, which I use for skies. Again, it literally, when you get it wet, it will turn into this sharp, pointy thing that, again, I'll use for uh, tree textures, skies. Uh, you can go from super, super thin lines to really wide uh, versions of it. I have two different smaller versions of that for other effects. Okay, water bottles next. So I have a tendency to use these really big heavy duty like backpacking hiking bottles. They're built like tanks. You can bang them around. One thing I would not advise is using those little uh, water bottles that you get at the store. The reason is is that they leak like crazy when you throw them in a backpack and will get your gear all wet. The smaller bottle I have tie-offs to put on my easel. And also, it's, again, very, very sturdy. I've been using it for about 10 years, never leaked on me. And I use this just for watercolor, so you can see how dark it is, and I would never drink out of that. So this other piece of equipment I'm going to show you is very specialized, but it works really well. It holds about 2 liters of water, and I got it at an Army War surplus store. It's an Army canteen. Uh, really, really heavy-duty uh, plastic and holds a lot of water, especially when you're going out to the desert or if it's going to be warm, it's good to have. Next up's uh, something as simple as a couple of rags. Now you like to use really soft, absorbent rags, basically dish towels, uh, instead of paper towels, because number one, you don't have to throw them away or they'll get away on you, and they're reusable. And a little chopstick to mix paint with sometimes. Okay, now on to the main event. We're moving into sketchbooks. Once again, very similar to color, this is a tricky subject because it's very subjective and it's my opinion. And I just am showing you what's worked really well for me and I'll actually even show you a couple of different brands. Here's a smaller one made by Handbook. And again, I like these a lot because they're really travelable, they fit inside a pocket. One thing I love about the Handbooks are they're built really sturdy, the binding's really tight, uh, they take a lot of punishment. Uh, I've been down a couple of river trips and actually dumped them into rivers and uh, fished them out and Upon drawing, they flatten right back out, back out again. Um, this is a larger version of it. And again, it's like about five by eight. Paper's really, really good. It's got, takes gouache and watercolor excellently, as well as pencil. And again, uh, is built really well. I also like the fact that when you open up the paper on the double sides, the paper's both the same on both sides of it. So you get a really consistent, good consistency. And then you can write notes on the inside pages. By the way, this is called a landscape format where the height is thinner than the length, the width of it. Works, like I said, really well for panoramas. As you can see, uh, what I was talking about the consistency of the page is that one, usually when you open up a sketchbook, the left-hand side paper is smooth and the right is a little bit on the rougher side. Uh, this, you can see that paint consistency is pretty good and it handles a pencil really well. Moving on, we go to Moleskin. Now, Moleskin has probably one of the biggest manufacturer of sketchbooks. This one happens to be a storyboard sketchbook that I grabbed accidentally. Paper's a lot shinier, it's a lot thicker, it doesn't accept uh, watercolors well, it does well with pencil, as you can see, but it gives you a different effect. And it's actually got little frames in it where you can do these like little uh, vignette sketches. 
One thing to keep in mind is, is the paper is not really made for watercolor. It's a little bit on the hard side, but it does accept the watercolor. So uh, I, what I do is use it for mixed media with uh, pencil, color pencil, watercolor, uh, even typewriter whiteout for the steam on the geysers that uh, I showed you. And of course, Molset Skin makes a huge amount of different kinds of books, so I'm sure you'll find something that will work for you. They actually have make an excellent watercolor uh, sketchbook. So this is called the Perfect Sketchbook, and you can see it's a portrait uh, format, which means that the height is wider than the width of the thing. And so it's got super, super good paper. The paper's really thick, quality stuff. Price might be a little bit higher than a usual sketchbook, but ex it's excellent to bring out the color. You also might notice that all the sketchbooks that I buy and use have hard covers to them to protect the insides. Uh, I really shy away from sketchbooks that have simple paper covers on them. Now remember, you're going to be doing your own research on this. You'll be going to art stores if you have a chance or going to different websites and see what other people recommend in relationship to the sketchbook. This is by C.Y. to Brighton. And it's my favorite one for these large format ones just because, again, when you open up the paper, the paper is the same on both sides, the same uh, roughness, the same thickness on it, uh, texture surface, all of that. And it makes for some uh, really, really nice uh, painting, very smooth. Uh, but Moleskin makes one of these. There's several companies that make this size format. Once again, I'm hard on my sketchbooks, so I have a tendency to get sketchbooks uh, that will take a beating pretty well. This last sketchbook sort of a ske specialty sketchbook in that you can go down and have your own made at a print company like Staples, Office Depot, um, Kinko's. A lot of times what they do is they have binding machines there. And that's what this is. This is simply a big, good combination of Canson paper, watercolor paper, drawing paper, and then I cut, have it all cut down and then bound, use a couple pieces of mat board that I buy cheap from a framing company that they don't use, and uh, just make my own up, my own format, my own size. And you can do this for everything. And they're very sturdy, and you can see the cover is very thick. And uh, that's one option for you as well. If you're going out in the field, this is a must-have item uh, to keep your stuff safe. And what I do is I buy these sort of... Uh, really heavy duty containers here with big heavy zippers. I put all my sketchbooks in every one of them. Not everyone may have a separate one, but they all get contained in this and all my equipment gets separate bags. So I may bundle up the palette, the tray, maybe the wet cloth in one, uh, the brushes, the uh, water containers, if they're dry in another. And then that way everything if you happen to uh, be out in a rainstorm or even fall into like a pond like I have sometimes, it'll keep everything fairly dry, really dry in fact. And if you like sharp edges on your paintings, pick up some artist tape, not masking tape. Masking tape will tear your paper and most of the time the color will bleed through, the paint will bleed through uh, and you will, will not have sharp edges. So this is where the sketching materials come in. And this is a container that I hold in my colored pencils and watercolor pencils, and also china markers and uh, watercolor blocks and color pencil blocks, and I'm holding this little thing along with sharpeners and erasers. And so what I do is I use this for a lot of urban sketching things where I need different textures or if I'm doing tree branches or stuff. And uh, that will come in a future demonstration, but this shows you how easy it is to contain it and how sturdy it is. Last but not least are the water containers. And this is a collapsible Faber-Castell cup. And the reason I like this is, again, it's built really well. I've got a couple of them. They've gone all over the place with me, never failed me yet. And they fit inside the cup holder on my easel. And they also are very, very sturdy. This is a collapsible plastic bucket that uh, I picked up from somewhere. And uh, again, real, holds a lot more water. It's a little bit more flimsy. Uh, I have to get one about every year, but it works very well in the field. Here's another cheap option. It's a doggy dish collapsible bowl that I bought at Petco. It costs about $4. Works really well. If you take it out in the field, sometimes a bottle doesn't work in a rocky area. You can put that down, fill it with water, and put a rock in it. It'll stay really well. This is used for dog treats. It's also waterproof. You can put it on your belt. You can actually put water in there and paint standing up. 
I found this works several different times in different areas, especially where there's not anywhere to sit down. Then what we have is this larger container. This holds a lot of water. It's also got places for brushes. You can see as I fold it out. Now, a lot of times I'll use this when I'm car camping or when I'm by a big water source because it eats up a lot of water. Uh, I don't use it in the field much, but it's very convenient. And once again, you can put it in an area, put a rock on the inside of it, and it'll stay on the ground really well. And it folds up by Aquatote. As we come to the end of the video, I wanted to show you this gear actually being used on site uh, in Italy, in Spain, uh, painting a bridge. Uh, you can see everything kind of laid out. It's very portable. I've got the whole kit, uh, except for the water, comes in at around about only two and a half pounds, about at the most. Uh, this is in Utah, in a drier area, where those larger bottles come in, so you'll be able to hoard more water as you go hiking around. It's really important so you don't get hung up to dry. This next shot is up in Northern California on the coast. That's where those dry bags are really important. You can see my backpack down there where all of this stuff fits into, including the uh, pallets, the equipment, and the easel. Here's painting in Ireland. One thing I left out of the video were small plastic clamps that work on the easel and also keep the paper down in windy weather. So once again, I'd like to thank you for watching the video. You can go to my Instagram page and see more work there and also GaryGarrett'sArt.com. And please feel free to share this and comment below. If you have questions, leave them on the uh, column below. And I will probably get back to you on them. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, please feel free to watch future installments.